Hello Year 12 students, this is a second video on how to word your question but the additional extra is how to potentially go about writing that introduction um, as well and uh, you can see the picture of Philip Larkin or pictures of him as well as the title for this particular video too. In the last video I went through four different statements that could potentially be applied and manipulated into a question for your NEA or non-examined assessment or coursework, whatever you want to call it. Um, I've chosen one of those uh, to demonstrate how you might word it. And here are the two options. The statement um, is the one at the top of the screen now. The desired effect of which the writer clearly need not be aware, is a perpetuation of the unequal power relations between men and women, Burton's 2001. Using ideas from the critical anthology to inform your argument, to what extent do you agree with this view? The same question has been worded ever so slightly differently, perhaps a little bit more concise. That's uh, on the second on the lower part of the screen, to what extent do you agree that Larkin seeks to perpetuate the unequal power relations between men and women? Burton's 2001 question mark at the end of at the end of all of the writing. It's full stop. Um, so that's just on the screen to push you in the right direction with regards to how you might word the question. The top option at the top of the screen is the most straightforward of them because it means you don't have to carve up the quotation in any way. But if you want to carve up the quotation because it, you, don't, you don't necessarily need all of the words in the, the quotation itself, then that's how you might go about doing it. So that's that, we move on. When I'm then going about writing the answer to this question, I, I need to be sure that I know what the question is actually asking. So whichever option I do, whether it's um, however, whichever wording I choose, the key word is whether he seeks to perpetuate, which means to make something continue forever and ever indefinitely, um, the unequal power relations. So if I start editing this document, it becomes, well, perpetuate means something continues indefinitely and as I carry on I need to consider in my opening what is meant by unequal and then as I carry on well hopefully I spelt it correctly what power relations specifically because power relations is such a broad and, and vague phrase. It's, it's all encompassing. So I need in the beginning of my piece of writing to define what power relations um, I'm going to look at. Um, because I've only got 1200 to 1500 words, not including word count or bibliography. Uh, and because I don't have that many words, I need to set the terms of my question. I need to define my question at the beginning at the same time as set up a debate. So how do I go about doing this? Now as I move down the screen and continue the video, uh, I have three or four uh, examples of the ways that you might do this. Um, and my argument is not consistent all the way for each particular um, method of beginning this essay. And that's deliberate because I don't want to push you into thinking that there is a, a correct answer. There isn't something that you have to write that makes your teacher agree with you and get more marks. Um, it's a case of you write what you think. What each of the examples does have, however, are vague language or tentative language, is a better way of putting it, tentative language at times, assertive language at other times. Um, but I'm trying to set up a debate. That's That's the main thing. I want there to be an obvious sense of a discussion being opened in my first lines, in my introduction, so that the rest of the essay can then seek to an answer the questions that I pose, or 
to prove the point that I'm making. So there are two ways to go about this, this kind of essay. I can either state my case right from the very beginning and then prove my point, or my introduction could set up the idea that I'm not entirely sure which way around it is, have the discussion in the essay before coming to a conclusion. It's that second approach that most students go with, um, but there's nothing necessarily wrong with that more um, assertive approach where you say, this is what I think, and now I'm going to prove it. So let me explain those as we move on. Some of you are quite happy with this first one already. Uh, it's where we one uses three adjectives and sort of uses those as a bit of a launch pad. Conceited, antagonistic and misogynistic, Philip Larkin evidently seeks to perpetuate the unequal power relations between men and women. This is an example of a beginning that is assertive. It's um, one where the case is being stated at the beginning and I would need to, to prove it in the rest of the essay. Words like evidently here highlighted on screen are really quite assertive. Um, some teachers are not always that keen on words like this in English because um, it arguably shuts down a debate. But as I say, it's not necessarily wrong if you then are able to justify it all the way through. There are problems with this approach, and it's arguably that these words here, conceited, antagonistic and misogynistic, they just kind of, they kind of become a like vocabulary soup. Um, maybe that's a me way of saying they're just words. I mean, what do you mean by conceited? What do you mean by antagonistic um, and misogynistic? And where's your proof for it? Um, we can't sling too much mud. We have to be a little bit tentative. So I'm, I'm also using this as a way to say there are right ways. There aren't necessarily wrong ways, but there are ways, if I use that word again, to write which allow you to be circumspect and cautious and assertive in terms of your argument. So these words in and of themselves are not wrong, but I would need to spend a bit of time justifying it later in the essay. A second approach is the if-then sentence. It's quite a simple thing. If I sit in the sun for too long with no sun cream on, then I'll get sunburn. Maybe you won't, but I certainly would. Um, and if we apply that to English literature essays it, and, and, and this particular question, if Larkin seeks to make something continue indefinitely, then it seems unlikely that it is the unequal power relations between men and women. Perhaps it could be argued that. This is an altogether more cautious approach, because I begin with a sort of conditional word like if, conditional, um, meaning it sets up a... If, if I begin with the word if, then I have to have a then. Uh, I'm laughing at how bad that sounded, but it, it made the point quite well, actually. Um, you can see that I'm using the definition of perpetuate, something continue indefinitely, um, which is good because it means that I'm answering the question in the very opening lines of, the uh, of my essay. But my cautious language is demonstrated in words like seems unlikely, um, and then the argument itself is toned down really with words like perhaps, and perhaps it could be argued. So all of these words here like could be, might be, perhaps, my modal verbs, uh, could, might, may, and so on, they help to hedge and ensure that the writing does not come across as too strong. At GCSE level, uh, those of you who I've taught in the past will perhaps recognise these two uh, in particular. Um, I will say in class something like, while I like chocolate, crisps are superior because. While Cristiano Ronaldo is an excellent footballer, Lionel Messi is... To, you know, um, a better player because. So again, it's a bit like if I'm setting up a, a condition. The first half of the sentence will say something, uh, and then we know that there's going to be a, a, 
The second half of the sentence will provide balance and a counterpoint in terms of argument. Although Philip Larkin could be considered to be misogynistic and leery in his presentation of women, it is possible to argue that in much of his poetry, his connoisseur's eye for the female form elevates the opposite sex to such a degree that rather than seeking to maintain the unequal power relations in favour of men ahead of women, he in fact seeks to elevate women above that of men. Now, there are a couple of important things that have just happened. One, as I was reading it, I recognised a slight error um, or a slight inelegance uh, in the way that it had been written. So I've changed it. And that's the process of checking your work. Um, just being, you know, the process of checking your work made explicit. The first word that was highlighted, however, was the word leery. And I deliberately included the word leery because it's, it's too informal. Um, it's too colloquial, too chatty. Uh, and so I'd want to be tweaking, changing that word leery to something a little bit more, um, yeah, to something more formal. Let's keep it as simple as that. So although Philip Larkin could be considered to be misogynistic, now if I don't have another word, I don't need vocabulary soup, as I mentioned earlier on. I, the one word is fine. The one word misogynistic is better uh, in this instance. And the one word misogynistic also helps to condense my word count. That will become important. So although he could be considered misogynistic in his presentation of women, I'm, I'm now setting up myself the chance to show off the argument as to where misogyny or sexism uh, is evident in the poetry. I'm now also then saying we could also argue that in much of the poetry, his connoisseur's eye for the female form elevates the opposite sex. Now here, in the word connoisseur, I'm, some of you might recognise this, taking a word from one of the poems, in this instance it's lines on a young lady's photograph album, where he does appear to be misogynistic. I think that's um, fair to say. He does appear to um, admire, ogle, the, the female form. But I'm using a word from the poem to show off the fact that I know the poems already. Um, and it signifies to a teacher or a moderator, whoever looks at it, that we're on the right lines for seeing something quite good here, I think. Anyway, if I carry on, it's possible to argue that in much of the poetry, his connoisseur's eye for the female form elevates the opposite sex to such a degree that rather than seeking to maintain the unequal power relations, and you can see there that in my opening sentence again, I make reference to the key words in the question. Because in doing that, I'm, I'm making it a topic sentence. My argument then stems into the balance parts that I mentioned earlier on. Although he is misogynistic, at times women are elevated above that of men. And in essence, that, that, that's a reasonable argument, which gives me a chance to show misogyny and to show love and positive regard for women. The last of them is a thesis statement. And a thesis statement is one where you, well, in many respects, it's already been done above. Um, but it, it, it gives you a bit more scope to write the way that you want to. So three adjectives, adjectives means you begin with three adjectives. If then means you begin with if then. While or although means that you begin with while Philip Larkin could be considered or although Philip Larkin could be considered. A thesis statement has no such sort of hard and fast rules. You just write what you want in relation to the question. However, what I have done here is include the three poems that I'm going to write about because that signposts to the teacher what to expect, what I'm going to read. Um, I would expect now, as I continue this essay, to read about lines on a young lady's photograph album, maybe first, then born yesterday, probably second in the piece, and then the wits and weddings, probably third. 
Um, so it's a good idea to put those in the order that you're going to write about them. Of course, one would hope that there'll be times of crossover where you write about two poems or maybe even all three of them at the same time. But necessarily, you're likely to start with one. Um, so put that one first. I can also make some improvements here and, and demonstrate a few things about how one should um, acknowledge poetry. In his poems, inverted comma, lines on a young lady's photograph album, inverted comma, born yesterday needs inverted commas around it as well, as does the wits and weddings. So an individual poem tends to have one inverted comma around it. If I were to refer to um, a text that you will study, The Kite Runner or The Great Gatsby, well, those are names of the text, a full text, a novel, and therefore I would expect to see those italicised. So small things, but um, important things to get right all the same. So what I want to see in um, an introduction is something which perhaps incorporates some of all of these. From three adjectives, I want to see some sophisticated terminology and vocabulary being used, but at the right times. The if-then sentence doesn't have to be used at the beginning. It could be used in the middle of the essay and it helps to establish debate. Um, while or although does exactly the same thing in a slightly different way. But here, look how the um, I took out some words in the first line. Look how one has used um, a quotation from one of the poems in the beginning to help establish the line of argument. Um, look how as I read it over, I, I, ju I just checked it and changed it because it didn't quite sound right. And in the final one, the three poems that I'm going to write about are referenced. Some are in, in the beginning part so that you're signposting to the teacher, to me, for most of you, um, what I'm going to expect to see. And so, well, what's now on the screen you've already seen and is argue a little, arguably a little bit long. Um, it does most of that and it does it quite well. Um, the question, so you did this for homework or, you know, um, lockdown work over the last couple of weeks. Larkin presents females as repeating familiar cultural stereotypes. Burton's 2001, if I'm being super picky. I need a full stop there. You just see me add one, hopefully, where the mouse is here now. The question is formulated in the same way as the first uh, question that we've seen at the very beginning of the video. And there's a, a really nicely written introduction, which, which in this case uh, is quite tentative and sets up a debate. Um, the three poems are referenced in the middle of the piece. And they just, as I say, signpost to the teacher what we're going to see. In essence, however, it's the last part of the piece which really does the, the work. And I'll read it from here, where I am now highlighting. Larkin's poem, Sunny Prestatin, Lines on a Young Lady's Photograph Album and Afternoons. Each of those three shouldn't really be italicised. They should have inverted commas. But anyway, they do indeed repeat familiar cultural stereotypes. But when it comes to the representation of women, the case can be made that he subverts the message of the futility of youth, beauty, and even life he aims to present within each poem. However, with Larkin, it is ambiguous as to whether this is rather the point. He may well write so as to be deliberately provocative. So much of what comes before that section um, is help, helpful, but not essential to the question. And so if one were to just begin with this, this section that I'm now highlighting, that would be a really nice start where I've got three poems named, I've got some effective vocabulary, I've got um, a clear sense of what the point of his poetry is. There are three things um, alluded to there, futility of youth, beauty and life. Um, and then just this counterpoint, however, it's unclear, it's uncertain as to whether he deliberately 
uses familiar cultural stereotypes. So hopefully that pushes you in the right direction with regards to how to write an, in, write an introduction, because what we want to see is either a very strong argument, a very assertive argument, where you then prove your point, or for the most part, for most of you, I suspect, an introduction which sets up a debate that you can then discuss in the rest of the work. So you've already seen this one. Um, look at it again in the light of this um, and consider how you might go about weaving together the best of um, what I've gone through here today and establishing an argument that you can write about convincingly and with a strong sense of credibility.